if you haven't had one of these moments, you undoubtedly will in your life. And it can happen at a young age, it can happen at a less young age. But we all have moments which end up in some way defining us in some shape or form. These moments where they might be unanticipated, they might not be planned, but they happen to you and you experience something in your life and it, it changes you. It shapes you, it changes the way you view things, it might change your perspective on life or your goals um, or your attitude. One of my friends had one of these. It was um, kind of just like any normal day. Uh, he had his day, he went to bed, and at 2.50 a.m. he got a phone call. And the phone call was from his transplant coordinator. And they said, hey, Tim, we have a heart for you. And at that point, his life changed um, because what he had been hoping for and wanting and needing um, did arrive and he um, he shared with me a video of, of him and his wife driving to hospital um, and they're just sharing what it's like in this moment to be about to go and experience what they're going to go through and this was for them this was a, a defining moment and that's a big one but I think they can also be be small things as well Have you had one of these in your life? A time, a moment, a day where for you everything kind of fundamentally changed. We're going through this series called Stories of the Cross. And in reality, each of the stories that we've looked at so far, the future trajectory of the people involved, their life has changed dramatically in these moments that we've explored. And today's one is, is no different. Um, if you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to open up to John chapter 18. If you have a blue Bible, it's page 931 and 932. And we're going to be looking at this. The story we're looking at today is the story of Pilate's and Jesus, and their experience, what it was like for them um, from Pilate's perspective, but also a little bit from Jesus' perspective as well. So John, we're going to start in chapter 18, actually, verse 28, and we're going to go through into, into chapter 19. Now, let's read from verse 18. Uh, 28 of chapter 18. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they didn't enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? Now, Pilate's role as the governor was basically look after three things. One, make sure they were getting money, Two, make sure that order was maintained. And three, make sure that justice was being served. And the, the Romans had this saying, which you can read up there. Um, I'll pronounce it for you, but my Latin's not great. Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. So they saw that their, the Roman nation was really built on the fact that their ability to rule relied on their ability to dispense justice. And so whether they did it fairly or not, that's a matter of conjecture, but they were big on justice. And that was part of Pilate's job. His job was there to make sure that justice was served. And so people would be brought to him and he would have the final say on what happened. This would happen often, regularly. And so this was no unusual experience. This was in some ways just another day for Pilate doing his job of dispensing justice. So, they bring this man to Pilate, and he says, what are the charges you're bringing against him? And the reply, 
well, if, uh, if he were a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you, which isn't really a response, is it? But that's a whole different <laughs> sermon. And Pilate said, okay, well, take him yourselves and judge him by your law. But then they say, well, we have no right to execute anyone. And this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate often had these interactions with the Jews. They would bring someone to him and he would say, hey guys, yes, this is within my jurisdiction. No, this isn't. This would take place fairly normal. Verse 33. So Pilate then went back inside the palace. He summoned Jesus presumably into the palace, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Pilate replied, am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? So you can see Pilate is trying to get to, what's, what's the problem here? Why, why are you before me? I'm here to dispense justice. What are you doing here? So far, he hasn't got very far. What is it that you've done? He asked Jesus. And Jesus replies, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Ah, you're a king then, Pilate says. And can you see Pilate's focus is on Are you a king? Are you not a king? Do you have power? Do you not have power? Jesus responds by saying, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate's focus is on power. Jesus' focus is on truth. And this is a really interesting situation that you find yourselves in. Because for Pilate, he's got a job to do. He's got the power to do it. And he's just trying to get to the bottom of this. Jesus doesn't seem to make it any easier for him. And his focus is not so much about Pilate's power or what that means. His focus is on revealing truth. And so this is going on. And then Pilate's response in verse 38 What is truth? Once again, a whole different sermon. But he's like, what is truth? Define truth for me. Where does truth fit into my landscape? Is it your truth? Is it my truth? It could be a question that anyone could ask today. And this is going on, and Pilate goes out to the Jews, and he says, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But it's your custom for me to release one prisoner at the time of Passover. So do you want me to release this king of the Jews? Second time he mentions king. Do you want me to release this king of the Jews? And what do they say? No. Who do they want? We looked at this, I think it was two weeks ago. Jared preached about this guy. Give Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas who'd taken part in an uprising. In another Gospels we find out he's a murderer. He's an insurrectionist. Seems to be the kind of thing Pilate would not want releasing, given his role. But that's what they ask for. And so at this point, the ordinary day seems to be getting a little bit unusual. It's a little bit different. This is not quite how things normally pan out. Let's continue. Chapter 19, verse 1. And in some kind of attempt to pacify the crowd, Jesus experiences something because Pilate says, take him and have him flogged. And if you've looked into what that entails, into what that's like, it's horrible. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, 
and put on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. It's like they are just got some low-life criminal there and they're just having some fun. And so once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis of a charge against him. And when Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe, Pilate said to them, He's the man. And the irony is probably he looked very little like a man. He probably looked more like a red shape that was just there. And as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. Did nothing to help the situation, did nothing to evoke any kind of empathy or pity. Instead, they say, no, we want more. Crucify it, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Now, at this point, the normal becomes really unusual. Pilate's a Roman. Romans believe that the gods sometime took human form. And so for him to hear this person is, is this divine being, as it tells us in verse 8 of chapter 19, when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. This has now become weird. This has now become strange. This is an unexpected, unanticipated turn of events. And Pilate goes back inside the palace and he asks Jesus, where do you come from? But he gets no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? It's as if Pilate's realized, hey, this is this has changed. And you know, have you ever experienced something where maybe you've been in a room and the temperature has, has really changed all of a sudden and everyone's noticed it? And in that moment, you can tell everyone has switched on, everyone is listening, there is not a sound anywhere because something has changed. It's, it's not just normal anymore. I think yesterday was a four-year anniversary of a special event for Australia where we realized that this was not just a little bug that was floating around. This was something that was going to change things for a serious period of time. We went into our first lockdown. Four years, yeah. And at that point, we thought, maybe this might be a short thing. But at some point, we started to realize, hang on, no, this is not just a simple virus. This is actually something that is going to impact us and change us and change probably the shape and maybe the trajectory of our lives, how we live, what we focus on, what our goals are. For Pilate, this is no longer a normal day. And while he's talking about having the power to release or crucify, Jesus says, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Pilate is still holding on to this idea that he's got the power to do things and to to change Jesus. But someone said, and I don't know who this was, but they said the one who appears to have power loses it in the presence of one who appears to be powerless. And so from that moment on, in verse 12, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. 
And for Pilate, that's kind of the end game for him. If you're going to accuse me of being no friend of Caesar, I'm not going down that path because this is, this is going to impact me in a big way. And so this is, this is now decision time for him. This is the moment, the defining moment for him. And is he going to choose to see justice served or is he going to serve his own interests instead? Is he going to listen to the crowd or is he going to listen to his conscience? When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of the preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. And Pilate said to the Jews, here is your king. But they shouted, take him away, take him away and crucify him. And once more, Pilate asked, shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. And finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. This is a defining moment which shaped his future. It shaped Jesus' future. It shaped our future. And defining moments shape the future, but I think they also reveal the past. And if you look back into Pilate's history, we don't have a lot, but we do know a number of things. We do know that he most likely got his role as governor from a guy by the name of Sejunus, who was no friend of Caesar. And as a result of this role, Pilate was already kind of working his way to be in the good books. But there are a few things that he did that give us an insight into who this guy really was. At one point, he brought in these, these Roman standards into Jerusalem. And no governor had done this before, but he was wanting to do this to kind of be, good, be a good man of Rome, represent, represent Caesar well. And so he, bring these in, he brings these in, and the, the people didn't like it. And so they started protesting against it. And, and his job was not just to collect taxes and distribute justice, but also to maintain the peace. And so when they're protesting, he goes in and he says, I'm going to have my soldiers kill you. And the people actually, Josephus records it, they put out their necks to make it easier for them. And at that point, he backed down and he didn't go ahead with it. Another time, he used the, the money from the temple treasury to build the aqueducts. And when he visited Jerusalem one time, because he lived in Caesarea and he'd come into Jerusalem for festivals just to make sure that things were kept in order and the peace was maintained. But when he came in, the people started a riot. And so he had his soldiers take off their uniforms and dress in like civvy clothes and distribute them amongst the crowd and he got them to beat the crowd for their rioting and, and their insurrection. This guy knew how to use his power. He was not afraid of blood or shedding it. He was mostly about protecting himself. And for him, I think the temptation for self-preservation, especially as someone living in the Roman world, was pretty strong. Jesus passed. He was different. See, where Pilate seemed like he wanted to release Jesus, but his self-preservation instincts took over, Jesus was different. Where Pilate wanted to do anything to save his own skin, Jesus, in reality no pun intended, probably had very little skin to save. And when we look back at Jesus' life, we can see why this was the way he could respond. See, he knew who he was. When he was baptized, he came up and they said, this is my son. God said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. He knew his mission was to come and seek and to save the lost. He told his disciples and he spoke to those around him about God's kingdom regularly. He reminded himself of what he stood for and what it was about. 
he regularly visited God in times of prayer. In Luke 5, we read that Jesus often went to places where he could pray. He often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. This was his regular habit. This is what he did all the time. And so when he came to this place where he could have responded so differently, he could have tried to defend himself. He could have tried to call on heaven's armies to come and protect him. Instead, he willingly submitted to all the torture, all the abuse, all the shame, or the injustice that he experienced. And I think Jesus was able to stand firm in a difficult moment because he had prioritized God in daily moments. See, that defining moment for him, I think it wasn't difficult for him. It wasn't difficult for him to make that choice because he knew who he was about. He knew who God was and he knew that he was there to follow God and do what God had called him to do. And can I suggest that when you and I, when we prioritize God in our daily moments, those daily moments actually are our defining moments. That's where we actually become changed. That's where we grow to be like Jesus. Those moments where you read your Bible and you talk to God, those moments where you pray, those moments where you connect with other people and encourage them and support them, those moments where you reflect on how God has worked in your life during that day, those are actually the things that define you. Those are the moments that shape you into the person who when those big things come, it's not difficult to choose because you have already been defined by the time you've spent with God each and every day. So what are your daily moments with God? Jesus had them. He had them every single day. And one day we're going to get to talk to him and ask him, hey, what did it look like your every day? How did you spend your time with God each day? But I, I am really sure that there was not a day that went by where Jesus was not thinking about the word, where he was not re repeating it or sharing it. There was not a day went by, probably not a moment, where he wasn't in communion with God and talking with God and bringing God into his everyday situation. When you walk with God this week, those daily moments that you have with him are the ones that actually will define you and define me. And so I want to encourage you, as we head towards Easter and as we reflect on the incredible sacrifice of Jesus, what he went through, what he experienced, that is the culmination of his walk with God up to that point. He was... He was so in tune with God because of the time he'd spent with him that to face all those things, he was, he was willing to do it so that we could have that same communion as well. So I want to encourage you guys to figure out how you can build this into your daily life. As the, the band comes up and we're going to close in worship, I want to encourage you to spend time over the next week reading through those last few chapters of Jesus' life. And you've heard it probably many times before, but can I encourage you to try and read it fresh? Read it as if you're there, as, you're, as if you're experiencing it, as if you're there watching it. Spend time realizing what it was that Jesus has done for us. Refresh it, renew it, reflect on it. But let that be something that just sinks into who you are and gives you a fresh and a beautiful awareness of who Jesus is, what he's done for you, and how you can then live that out in your life.